الحمد لله الحمد لله هادي خلقه الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الواحد الأحد الفرد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وهادينا وإمامنا ومعصومنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله ما آتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له أما بعد Dear committed Muslims, brothers and sisters We're going to press on with further information obviously with reference to Allah and His Prophet to clarify these hazy and disturbed parts of our impression, of our internal thoughts, and our public mind. And this khutbah is going to go in three directions. One of them pertains to Allah's beloved Messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, the other one pertains to his companions, as Sahaba. And the third one briefly pertains to a person who narrated, or on his authority, we find the narration of probably more a hadith than anyone else, i.e. Abu Hurairah. As you heard at the beginning of the khutbah, a couple of ayat that speak about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا This ayah says, a committed Muslim, Muslim has no choice once Allah and his messenger have decided on a matter. And whoever contradicts Allah and his messenger has gone manifestly wayward. The ayah, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ A committed Muslim, male or female, have no option وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنًا إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ 
if Allah and his apostle decide on a matter then this committed Muslim man and committed Muslim woman don't have any other choice so the Prophet may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him obviously presented us with his whole lifetime and with 23 years of enlightened behavior and a progressive attitude and here we are many many centuries later quibbling among ourselves some of us argue ourselves into animosity on this affair and here's what we have we have basically two opinions or two evaluations or two perceptions of what Allah's Prophet said one of those is that Allah's Prophet is a human being just like you and me were made of certain elements were made of flesh and clay we have our physical presence in this world and then we have our internal emotions and feelings and thoughts and inclinations and tendencies and desires and all of this the Prophet was just like any one of us in as far as this composition is concerned and because he is human he can make minor mistakes and that does not violate his prophethood that does not take away from his sublime character that does not harm his reputation this opinion holds that a prophet may forget or a prophet may be inclined to opt for an option if there are two or three legitimate legal moral options he may opt for an option that is lesser than the other one this opinion holds that prophets may fall into this description and that does not take away from their isma this opinion says that the prophet's asma is in communicating allah's message to his people and to humanity without any mistakes without any thoughtlessness without forgetting without these other human qualities that we all have when it comes to the prophet communicating and explaining and behaving the meanings that come to him from Allah he is immaculate he is infallible that's one opinion and the reason we're presenting these two opinions is because Muslims are worked up because of these opinions and they think that there's no room for the other Muslim if if someone holds on to one of these opinions then the other Muslim is somehow a lesser Muslim or not a Muslim at all in the extreme cases the other opinion holds that the prophets do not make mistakes 
whether these mistakes are major or whether they are minor. They don't make these types of mistakes. Prophets do not forget. Whether this pertains to what the prophets are communicating from Allah or what they are explaining from Allah or whether it has to do with some type of other issues that are more in the realm of experience or in the realm of human application. Across the board, this is the character of Allah's Prophet because this is what to them, to the second opinion, this is what isma or infallibility means. Okay, this is what we have. In short, this is what we Muslims have inherited in all of these generations. Now, with this clarification, we take <coughs> some examples that are in this common history to try to give it some of our thought. We know in the, our Prophet's history, there was what is referred to as Hadithat al-Ifq, that event of calumny against his wife Aisha. There were some people who, because she was left behind, and then when she caught up with the rest of the Muslims and the Prophet, in that small time period, some people accused her of immorality. And the ayat were revealed in the Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ Those who bring forth into society this defamation of Aisha are a usba from you. We encountered the word usba in another ayah, in another surah in the Quran. The children of Yaqub, Bani Israel said, لَيُوسُفُ وَأَخُوهُ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَبِيْنَا مِنَّا وَنَحْنُ عُصْبَةٌ So these promoters of Aisha's less than moral character, we don't want to use the sharp words that they use. In this history, was there not moments in the Prophet's life in which he contemplated, thought deeply about what people are saying and what is to be done. Now, this is an event that all Muslims acknowledge happened. What Muslims have not exerted their mind on or about is the Prophet's interim approach to this development. Until the ayah was revealed. When the ayah was revealed, it all became history. Water under the bridge. So in that interim, which opinion applies? That's question number one. And if we just begin to think, we are moving in the right direction. Another incident that is related in these books of history. The Prophet, upon his arrival in al Medina, he found people who were, what you would say, trimming their date palm trees so that the next season, the produce or the fruits will be more. And he said, what if you were to leave them without trimming them? Wouldn't it be better? 
They thought come this sentence coming from Allah's Prophet, maybe what he meant was we stopped trimming these trees. So they stopped. And when the season rolled over, when these trees were going to give their fruits, produce the dates, it turned out there weren't, there weren't many of them. So they went to the Prophet, these individuals who thought this was the case, and they told him exactly what happened. And in answering that, he said, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. When it comes to the affairs of your earthly responsibilities, you know better. Uh, this is another thing to think about when you have these two opinions of whether the Prophet Asma somehow takes away from his humanity, takes away in the sense that he's no longer human, he's almost an angel. Or the other opinion that says, but he is human and therefore subject to all of what other human beings are subject to. And that somehow takes away from his asma. He's, this is the area that Muslims begin to develop divisive arguments about. There's another incident in the Prophet's seerah. And that is in one of the battles at Badr. The Prophet wanted the Muslims to camp in a certain position in preparation for the encounter with the mushriks who are coming from Mecca to do war with the Muslims. So a person goes up to the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his, and asks, أَهَذَا مَنْزِلٌ أَنزَلَكَهُ اللَّهِ أَمْ هُوَ الرَّأْيُ وَالْحَرْبُ وَالْمَكِيدَ Is this place, is this position one that Allah has assigned to you? Or is it an opinion? Is it logistics? Is it war? And whatever comes with war. And the Prophet answered, it is the latter. Meaning Allah didn't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell me to pick this particular position. Then Al-Habbab, that was the name of the Sahabi, who told the, asked the Prophet that, he said, well, this is not where we should be. He said, where should we be then? Then he said, we should be in a position that will not provide access to the mushriks to the waters of Badr. And the Prophet accepted that. Now, however way you understand this, does this, number one, does this violate this incident? I'm just narrating the incident. That's all we are doing. Does this and this exchange of words between the Prophet and Al-Habbab. Does this violate the Prophet's asma? Or does this make him superhuman? Depending on these two opinions that we have inherited, not thinking about them, in our common history. The incident when the Prophet was in al Medina, and there was a host of enemies who were in alliance with each other, the Mushriks of Arabia, centered around the chieftains of Mecca. The Prophet thought that this grand alliance can be diminished or broken and one of the ideas he 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had was to offer them one third of the produce of al Madina. These events are in the books of seerah and history. Now, he presented this suggestion, let us give, the, give them these a portion of these enemies, one third of the agricultural output of al Madina. And Al-Ansar said to him, but no, we'd rather not do that. He accepted that. Once again, where this is a, this is a behavior, this is a decision, this is a quote-unquote sunnah, where do you put it? Does it substantiate the isma that raises the Prophet above being a human being? Or does it substantiate the human nature in the Prophet that tends to violate his isma? Is any of that going on in the public mind? And if it is, if you think about this in a way that you are dividing the Muslims... I don't think you understood the Prophet or his seerah or his quote-unquote sunnah. There's another hadith that is related to the Prophet and it has to do with judging. The Prophet says, I'll skip the quote, I mean the Arabic quote, and give you the translation. The translation is, I'm put in a position, the Prophet is saying, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his. He's saying, I'm put in a position at times to judge between you or among you. And there may be a person who can present his case with more eloquence and with more details and with more evidence than another person. That doesn't mean that he is innocent. But because the other person cannot match the presentation of his counterpart in court, that may lead me to judge in favor of a person just because he has his method or he has his ways of presenting his point of view, that will lead me to judge in his favor and if that happens and I judge against an innocent person then the person who led me to that judgment will have a share a proportion of the fire in the world to come now when the Prophet is speaking like this what he is doing here He is integrating himself into the social fabric. And that social fabric has people in it who want to present their point of view to override or to incriminate others. Does that mean the Prophet is involved in that? And once again, where does it stand between Allah's Prophet's Isma and Allah's Prophet's humanity. There's no contradiction here. Unfortunately, in the minds of people who don't think, they begin to raise this issue to divide us. And then, what do we say if we just step out of the seerah and the, the the behavior and the quotes and the hadiths of the Prophet. We go to an ayah in the Quran. Musa encounters a wise man, whether he is al Khidr or not. And the ayah in Surah Al Kahf has Musa speaking to this sage and saying to him, Hal attabi'uka? عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ مِنْهُ رُشْدًا May I follow you 
so that I may learn from you matters of maturity. Now, Musa, just like Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon both of them and the rest of Allah's prophets and messengers. Musa is asking a person who, and this is the majority opinion among Muslims, is not a prophet, whether he is al Khidr or an unknown sage, because this is what we have. I'm presenting to you what we have, nothing more, nothing less. So Musa is asking him, may I follow you so that I may learn in issues pertaining to a more mature character. هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ رُشْدًا When you hear Musa, and Musa is ma'asoom, just like Muhammad is ma'asoom, just like Isa is ma'asoom, Ibrahim is ma'asoom, Yunus is ma'asoom, etc. When you hear something like that, that does that take away from the isma of Musa? Or does that take away from the humanity, the humanness of Musa? Areas which we have not visited with our working minds. And that's why the sectarians today poke these issues so that we take opposite positions from each other, work ourselves up to what is happening nowadays. Now I'll transition to the Sahaba. And I'm going to read. This is, these are some long ayat. I have to read them because there are people out there, if I don't read them, they will say, you know, he's uh, sort of hijacking some meanings from the Qur'an. Okay, this is from Surah An-Nisa, ayah 97 through ayah 100. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قالوا فيما كنتم قالوا كنا مستضعفين في الأرض قالوا ألم تكن أرض الله واسعة فتهاجروا فيها فأولئك مأواهم جهنم وساءت مصيرا إلا المستضعفين من الرجال والنساء والولدان لا يستطيعون حيلة ولا يهتدون سبيلا فأولئك عسى الله أن يعفو عنهم وكان الله عفوا غفورا ومن يخرج من بيته مهاجرا إلى الله ورسوله ثم يدركه الموت فقد وقع أجره على الله وكان الله غفورا رحيما These ayat they speak about those who on the day of resurrection and accountability plead their innocence Because they say they had no wherewithal in the world. They're pleading their innocence. Then the answer to them was a question. They were asked, but wasn't Allah's land and territory and earth wide enough for you? You could just go. Leave the land of tyranny. Leave the abode of injustice. And go into this extended and expanded domain of Allah. (laughs) 
And then Allah speaks about those who did that when they went from Mecca to Al Madina. And He speaks about those who stayed in Mecca and did not go to Al Madina. Muslims who stayed in Mecca. Now, are we going to judge these Muslims by the meanings of these verses in the Quran? Or are we going to judge them by a notion that has come to us through 14 centuries, the word called as sahaba This is what happens. When the Quran is absent, troublemakers move in and occupy our minds and our psychologies. There is a shar'i definition for a sahaba which is inclusive of the hijrah, is inclusive of sacrifices, inclusive of selflessness, not only personal selflessness, but social selflessness that omits racism, it omits Islamophobia, it excludes prejudice and bias. But what if there are people who are prejudiced and biased? And then they want to present themselves as holier than thou, with labels of Islam and faith and commitment. Are you fooled by the labels? Cannot see through them to the character of who that person or, or those persons are? This is what happens. We part from the Quran and we fall victims to this inability to do so. Now we had in our history, in our common Islamic history, we had people who went from Mecca to al Medina, But they didn't go from Mecca to al Medina during times of trials and tribulations. They went to Mecca and al Medina in the last couple of years when the hardships were basically over. These were before the tulaqa, before the wufud. What do you want to say about them in light of these ayat in the Qur'an? The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, says, لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no hijra after the liberation of Mecca. So why are these people streaming now from Mecca to al Medina? Where were they when they were expected to go from Mecca and al Medina to solidify the Islamic determination in al Medina? Where were they? And then how do you equate those pioneers at the beginning with the latecomers at the end? Another ayah in Surah Al-Hujurat, the ayat are from 14 to 17. And many of you have heard these ayat. قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ The Arabians said, We are committed Muslims. Hullam tu'minu. Say to them, no, no, you're not committed Muslims. Walakin qulu aslamna. Rather say, we have acquiesced. Walamma yadukhuli al imanu fi qulubina. And up until now, iman has not penetrated our hearts. That's a description of who they are. Now remember, none of these ayat that you are hear, hearing has the word Sahaba in it. It's speaking about Mu'mineen, it's speaking about Muslimin, it's speaking about Muhajireen, it's speaking about Ansar, it's speaking about Sadiqeen, etc. You won't find the word as Sahaba here, that word that came later on and eclipsed Quranic terminology. وَإِن تُطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ 
Innamal mu'minun. Indeed, the committed Muslims, alladheena amanu billahi wa rasoolah, are those who committed themselves to Allah and His Messenger. Thumma lam yartabu. Then, had no doubt about that commitment. Where's the word Sahaba? The ayat go on. As I said, for those who want to read the full ayat, I'm sorry because this is a matter of time. I'm just simply running out of time. Surah Al-Hujurat, ayat 14 through 17. Read them, and while you read them, on or in a parallel fashion have the word Sahaba in your mind that way you can filter what we have now we come to Abu Huraira I know brothers and sisters I mentioned this before but I have to say it again It is not easy deconstructing 14th century of a false impression. That's not easy. This is what Al-Bukhari says, well, before I get to Al-Bukhari. Abu Huraira was told to leave al Madina and go to Bahrain. Some people would say Abu Huraira was banished from al Madina to al Bahrain during the time of Allah's Prophet. What was the reason for that? Now, lest someone come and begin to interject the notion of sectarianism in this, we are trying to approach Allah and His Prophet in an inclusive manner with brotherhood and with cooperation. Al-Bukhari narrates this hadith. And this hadith is one that Abu Huraira said. So this is Al-Bukhari and Abu Huraira. لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي وَإِنِّي لَآخَرْ فِيمَا بَيْنَ مِنْبَرِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ إِلَى حُجْرَةِ عَائِشَةِ You could see me, one of those at the end in the area extending between the minbar of Allah's Prophet and the chambers of Aisha. Maghshiyan alayya. I had fainted. Lost consciousness. Fayaji'u al-ja'i. A pedestrian comes by. فَيَضَعُ رِجْلَهُ عَلَىٰ عُنُقِي And he places his foot over my neck. وَيَرَىٰ أَنِّي مَجْنُونَ He thinks, he considers that I'm crazy. وَمَا بِي مِنْ جُنُونَ I'm not crazy. Ma bi illa al jua. I am hungry. This is Al Bukhari narrating to us a quote from Abi Huraira himself. He's describing himself. He's hungry. This is a person who is subject to his stomach. Another strong 
indicator of who Abu Huraira was in the battle of Mu'tah. The battle of Mu'tah was the battle before the last one in the Prophet's lifetime. The Muslims were seriously outnumbered. This was like what they would call today a kamikaze battle. The three leaders of this military campaign became shuhada. Abdullah ibn Rawaha, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, and Zayd ibn Haritha, in no particular order. During, in this battle, Abu Huraira was present. Was he there fighting in the front row? Was he in positions that would mean imminent death? No, he ran away. These are descriptions that we have. Now you ask yourself, with this word as sahaba eclipsing everything and with the usurpation of power by the Umawis and later on with writing the hadiths you begin to put all of these issues together and you will have a healthier understanding of the type of history that we carry and the type of troublemakers today who study our history, study our psychology, and then throw us into these battles in which tens of thousands of Muslims are killed every month. If totally, I mean, if we add all of them up. O oh Allah, we ask you for the right direction, for accuracy in what we are saying, and for an extended hand of brotherhood, cooperation, and a common destiny. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أدعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم وصلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Dear committed Muslims, we are living in an atmosphere that is charged. And this atmosphere that is charged now is charged with feelings of hatred against Muslims. This San Bernardino thing that happened with all our question marks and our criticism of the information, the barrage and the flood of information that has followed this event. We will now, I'm going to go over some incidents that happened in these past couple of weeks or so to Muslims here in the United States or others. On December December 4th, there's a CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations in St. Louis, received a voicemail threatening to cut off Muslim heads. On December 5th, in the Queens, in New York. A Muslim store owner 
was told by a customer, I will kill you. On December 5th, the same day, one of the two Muslim congressmen from Indiana, the Democrat from Indiana, Andre Carson, receives a death threat on the 5th or 6th of December in Tampa, Florida. A man throws stones at a car in which he sees a Muslima driving because she's wearing her hijab. On the 6th of December in Buena Park, California, a Sikh temple, because they confuse Muslims with Sikhs. Sikhs have turbans and they have beards and they all look alike to them. So they vandalize a Sikh temple. In Alameda County, California, also on December 6th, a woman threw hot coffee on Muslims who were praying in a public park. On the 7th of December, a, in Manhattan, New York, a man comes in and asks some of these employees, are you Muslims? And then when one of them says yes, he slaps the Muslim on the face. On the 8th of December, in Philadelphia, at Al-Aqsa Islamic Society, a pig's head was thrown into the yard there. On the 7th of December, a masjid in New Jersey receives hateful letters. On the 9th of December, Passengers in Seattle, Washington, passengers attack a ride-share driver on the 9th of December. A man tells a woman, I can't wait for the U.S. to get rid of you trash. On the 10th of December, the Council of American Islamic Relations receives hateful mail with unknown substance in it. They want to scare people, giving the impression that this is some type of poison that is sent in this letter. On the 10th of December in Grand Forks, North Dakota, a man sets fire to a Somali restaurant. On the same day, in Phoenix, Arizona, windows of a masjid are smashed. On the same day, the 10th of December, in Tampa, Florida, a Muslim woman's car is shot at while she was leaving the masjid. On the same day, the 10th of December, in Plano, Texas, a Muslim family's house windows were smashed multiple times. On the 11th of December, in Coachella, California, a man sets fire to a masjid. On the 12th of December, in Dallas, Texas, 20 people hold an armed protest in front of a masjid. On the 13th of December, in Hawthorne, California, two South Cal California masjids are vandalized, one of them at which a fake grenade was found. And there is an Ahmadi, Qadiani, Islamic center there in California that was spray painted with the words Jesus and Jesus is the way on the fence. This is the country in which they say it is multicultural and multinational and multi this and multi that.
Who's behind this? Who's trying to ignite these? It's not enough that they're trying to ignite sectarianism. Among Muslims, they want to also ignite hatred among Muslims between Muslims and Christians. This is the real world we are living in. And we wish this real world was looked at from all the minbars so that the Muslims' consciousness will grow and we can become immune to those who are dividing us anywhere and everywhere and however they can. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna tiba'a wa arina al-batila batilan warzuqna ijtinaba ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم إليك نشكو ضعف قوتنا وقلة حيلتنا وهوانا على الناس يا أرحم الراحمين أنت ربنا وأنت رب المستضعفين فإلى من تكلنا إلى غريب يتجهمنا أم إلى عدو ملكته أمرنا إن لم يكن بك علينا غضب فلا نبالي ولكن عافيتك هي أوسع لنا نعوذ بنور وجهك الذي أشرقت له الظلمات وصلح عليه أمر الدنيا والآخرة من أن تنزل بنا غضبك أو تحل علينا صخطك لك العتبى حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم اللهم بارك على محمد وآل محمد اللهم بارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم وأقم الصلاة Allah, 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 Allah,